still, even after five years, deeply humbling and awesome to me to be here. But I consider my privilege, considering the tears in my eyes, just an overwhelming silence. I'm walking in the footsteps, in the paths, in the halls of the very heart of history of this great state. Thank you. 
here, they reduce the public's trust in this institution. Mr. Speaker, fellow members, you may feel this doesn't rise to the scope of this, but I ask you, if they can't fulfill their office because no one can trust them, how can they be qualified? The state's constitution 1850, 1908, 1963, have maintained that this body is the sole judge of its members' qualifications. There is no other standard, no necessary criminal behavior or felony. In fact, in the manual of legislative procedure, it says the oath that we all take and each individual member's conduct is the sole protection against an unjust expulsion. They have both admitted their guilt. They both agree to the damage they've done. And neither can offer any convincing, reliable argument that they are either being fully honest now, or that the dishonesty, disrespect, and disdain was the outlier instead of the norm, and that it is the true expression of their character. Now, even now, in this chamber, these two members are spreading absolutely false and misleading statements about the chair of the committee, and seeming to conspire uh, together again in another blatant misdirection, absolutely no deal was struck. In fact, the chair specifically told that member there was no guarantee that the recommendation by legal counsel would be the final vote of either the committee or this body. No guarantee was offered. In the presence of legal counsel, I made that statement. No guarantees the committee would accept the recommendation. I wasn't even present when the statement was signed. It was on a completely different day. So to allege that somehow twisted arms to get a statement that was not willy willingly signed is completely disrespecting the truth and maligning the chair of the committee. The claim is totally ludicrous anyway, because it shows a continuing disrespect for this process, for the ignorance of this process. The chair knows, I've been here a little while, I know that I can't force members of this body to vote in any sort of way, or members of the committee. I couldn't make that kind of guarantee. It's totally ludicrous. And the other member now alleges the process has been rushed and is unfair, despite statements he made under oath to the contrary just yesterday. This deliberate attack is yet another violation of our house rules by attacking a fellow member. You, may, you Mr. Speaker, members of this body, might not feel that the investigation went far enough or that there would be further proofs to add on to their admitted guilt. I ask you, what more is necessary? They admit to the wrongdoing. They admit to the deceit. They admit to destroying trust with willful misconduct. And if there be further matters to inquire into this house, connected or exposed 
love. Stand with me in voting to restore the glory and honor of this body, its strength, its diligence, its respect, its beauty, its order, its forthrightness, and its integrity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for representing.
in our uh, our mission uh, was very difficult. You know, we refer to ourselves and we refer to this chamber as an honorable body, and we use that term uh, very quickly, sometimes flippantly, as if it's our first name, the honorable fill in the blank, the honorable body. Where does that honor come from? And I've been thinking a lot about that lately. Where, where does honorable come from? It doesn't come from this beautiful building. It doesn't come from these desks. It doesn't come from the, the facility that we work in. It comes from us. We have to provide the honor that goes into this honorable body. And we are not perfect people. God knows we all make mistakes. We are imperfect. And we should always strive to correct our imperfections, to work on them, to seek forgiveness. And more importantly, to correct any errors that we have made in life. It's painful for me to have sat through these proceedings over the last several days and hear about what we just heard right now from Rep. Corser. It was a moment, a bad moment. How many bad moments maybe have we had in our lives? We have, we have, I bet we've all had our fair share. But what do we do when you have a bad moment? Well, God willing, we try to correct it. We ask for prayer. We ask for forgiveness. We try to change our ways. It doesn't happen overnight. But we work on it. And in this particular case, and Mr. Speaker, I am speaking to both resolutions. Thank you, Representative Isaac. Please do. You know, we've, we've heard about uh, these moments, these moments in time that have led to bad decisions. But how many... How many of us continue along a bad path once a transgression has occurred? Do we work to cover up the transgression? Do we work with our, our taxpayer finance staff to cover up that transgression? Do we issue repulsive and insulting emails deliberately to try to create a false flag, to do a controlled burn, to try to inoculate the herd. Who the hell is the herd? The herd, I guess, is the public. It's you, it's me. It's the people who elected these two individuals to office. That's really shameful behavior. You're not asking for forgiveness. You're not asking for contrition. You're digging that hole deeper and deeper. And it doesn't just happen overnight. This has happened over time. This has happened for a long time. And if you review the record, if you review that 800 pages that we've all had to look at and suffer through these past couple of weeks, you'll see that this is not something that just was a one-off deal. This has been going on for a while. I will submit my opinion only that I think this has been going on into last year maybe even a couple years before that. So this is a pattern of behavior. This is a pattern of behavior that has, over time, not only rendered these two individuals unfit for office, and has not eliminated their qualifications for office, but has disrespected the people that they took an oath to serve. And it's their residents who are the real victims in this thing. So what we need to do is do the right thing and put an end to this. This has got to stop, and it's got to stop today. Now, I don't know what we're going to hear on the other side of the aisle here today. And anyone who suggests that we're rushing this process or that it was unfair, even though Rep. Corser said on the oath yesterday that it was fair, is simply putting on a display of their lack of knowledge. Within one month, all of the following took place. 
record of investigation. The House Business Office collected hundreds of pages of emails. Thirteen witnesses were interviewed. Five hours of audio were listened to repeatedly and transcribed and listened to by all the members of our select committee. A draft report was written. Outside, legal counsel was hired and reviewed the draft report and evidentiary record. A final report was then written. A committee was created and adopted rules. All committee members and legal counsel were given a week to review carefully and digest the record. And the entire record was made public. Now, we presented a detailed brief on why the expulsion for Rep. Corser and censure for Damrat were appropriate. And we reviewed those recommendations, and our committee also quizzed the witnesses. We reviewed the, the, the documents, we listened to the tapes, and we determined on our own that expulsion was the proper course of action for both individuals. In fact, even the accused members have admitted the evidence, and they've admitted that this process has been fair and open and just. Now, they can provide excuses, but they admit that the evidence is, un is incontrovertible. But there's always going to be an excuse. It was a moment. We heard, maybe we had a moment here today. What I resent is seeing the moments that I've witnessed on this House floor today with press conferences in the corners and on the House floor, that brings shame and disrespect to this body. And I'm tired of it. And it's got to stop. And it stops today. All the evidence in possession of the House will be retained if law enforcement is interested in investigating it. They can have it. Frankly, this process has been more fair and more transparent than any investigation of wrongdoing by any other city official. If you think you can do it better, go for it. But I got to tell you, any vote less, any vote less than expungement, than, than expulsion today, you own it. You own it. So I'm just telling you folks, the work has been done, the process has been fair, the evidence has been admitted to, the moments have got to stop. And we've got to bring honor and respect and dignity back to this body. I urge I urge you all to support the expulsion, the, the expulsion of these two individuals. It pains me to say it, but it is the right thing to do for these folks, for their districts, for their voters, for the people that they represent, and, and most importantly, for this honorable body. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Mike. Chair recognizes Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
started this whole thing. I want to sit here and go used to talking to, to my colleagues. Uh, if it wasn't for that, I'd be taking that court. Now, you know, I know this 800 page book, full of information, uh, was put together, for, put together for us by the House Business Office and by the Council. Leadership Council. I'm not going to take that book. It's, it's gospel truth. I mean, I, I'm not going to get to the bottom of what's in this report. And every time, not every time, I shouldn't say that, multiple times, my questions were ruled out of order. I judged the votes, I was shut down. You know, talk about this being on a fast track. I mean, come on. A month, they did the, the report, they put the investigation together. We have for a week to look at. We have a week. Now, if you look at some of the past explosions, there were weeks or months of committee meetings. Multiple, multiple witnesses called. A true bipartisan effort. Three Republicans, three Democrats. I don't see any of that in this committee that I, that I see. I, I, I didn't see any of that that would have taken the time to do things right. Uh, the subpoenas for Keith Allen were told time and time again. Her counsel said they, they wouldn't they would come in. Sabina, it's immaterial. You subpoena somebody, they have to sit in a chair. We ask for subpoena power, and the subpoena power was being brought up. I would like to hear Ballard say, no, I'm not going to answer any questions. In the fifth, whatever, whatever he has to do, but I don't see him in the chair in front of me. So my colleague actually found out that Keith Ballard was he would testify. And if he received the subpoena, he would come in. We let our compromise on the committee to know that. I'm uh, sure. Okay, at least now we're going to get to hear a key. They said, no. I don't understand how that How do you argue that? These are the two guys that started the whole thing. Oh, it's in the report. Isn't the committee put together?
on the other side of the aisle talked about the importance of you know integrity and diligence and our responsibility to the institution and to this body. It was also said that if anyone came up and um, sort of opposed the process was because there was simply lack of knowledge. You know, I don't know. Not 
respectful of the institution, nor is it respectful of us as representatives who are elected to make very important decisions for the people they are elected to represent. How can I move conscious make this decision today? I can't. And the first time in five years, I will be refusing to vote today. I refuse to give any validation to this process, to this lack of process. There may have been things that we've done wrong, but we need more time, I believe. We need more information from more people. And I hope that you will join me in refusing to vote today and to demand that we have a deeper investigation outside of the House Business Office that we really look into exactly what happened, who did what, when, where, and why. Chair Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise regretfully to uh, inform you all that I will not be voting today on the resolution before us. I have asked permission if I may to address both resolutions. Yes, sir, please. Thank you. Uh, I agree, I would say, I will start by saying that I agree certainly with the chair of the select committee on one thing, and that is that this proceeding and what we're doing here today is about restoring public trust. There's no question about that. And that is something that should be paramount in all our minds. Um, like all of you, I am disgusted by the revelations that we've seen in the last few months now uh, regarding the behavior of our technologies. But the only thing worse than the disrepute that they have brought upon this house is the process that has undergone that has been undertaken in the last week or so to try to get the truth. We have not gotten to the truth. And the only way we're going to restore public trust is if we get to the truth. It is absurd that we would have in a, in a so-called investigation employees who serve at the, at the pleasure of the Speaker of the House of Representatives investigating themselves. That, that's what's been going on here. Now, this is not the first time that we have expelled members from the Michigan legislature. Everybody knows that. But in these prior episodes, the process has been far, far different. Don't let anybody confuse you and, and tell you otherwise. In the past, it's been a non that's what we need here today. The public is not interested in our partisanship. They're interested in our integrity. And our integrity is on the line here today. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened when the employees of the two representatives went to the speaker's office and complained about being coerced or pressure to engage in illegal activity. I don't know what happened. Except I know they were fired. Everybody in this room knows that when you terminate somebody, you have to fill out a form and you have to get a signature from the speaker or his designee or her designee. What does that mean? That means that someone signed off, someone in the leadership signed off who are blowing the whistle. Why aren't we looking at that? We are here to police ourselves. Nobody is going to police us but ourselves. And a one-way process, an 800-page report that gets dumped on us 48 hours before we're supposed to vote, smells of something other than a diligent investigation. It suggests something else. One of the speakers mentioned bad moments, bad decisions, and cover-ups. Does that sound familiar? That's what's going on here. 
It is beneath us. It's beneath us. We must do better. The other thing that's at stake here is democracy. Those of us who are going to refuse to vote to, 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 to support a sham process are doing so because we know that 90,000 people are represented by each of these representatives as badly as they appear to have performed. It is not our process to remove people except under very, very, very limited circumstances. And it is not clear that we have had those circumstances. And even if we have, who really thinks that the Mission House representative is going to do anything more with this if this is all settled today and we are white you know, If this is all going to get buried, it's all going to get white on the rug. That's not the way we should be operating here in the state of Africa. So, I want to close by just saying that I appreciate uh, what my colleagues have attempted to do who serve uh, on the Democratic side of this community. They did their best. They tried as hard as they could to get to the truth, but they were impeded. They were stopped. They, they hit a brick wall. And I urge everybody in this room to think long and hard about closing down this investigation. What you're going to be doing today if you vote yes, you're closing down the investigation when we have not even heard from the two people who know more about this than anybody else. The two people who brought these allegations to our attention. I don't know any place where that goes on. So I simply want to end by saying, yes, there have been bad moments, there have been bad decisions. And there have been cover ups. I don't know if that's taking place here in this body. But if we vote yes today, we'll never know. And the people and the trust that we are trying to build uh, will be very, very difficult to restore. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Thank you, Representative Thompson.
talk to my wife, uh, know how much I had thought about this, calling former legislators, including my mentor who served in this body for 22 years, who actually had served during the Monte Carlo expulsion of this chamber, and ask them, you know, what did they look at? What did they see? And again, we talked about whether it's the two expulsions that have happened since 1963 or the different select committees that were created, but resulted in people actually resigning before the expulsion vote. What you saw in every single instance was that there were already criminal charges. And in most cases, the criminal charges had actually worked their way through the court process. Monty Jarrett's case, the one that we dealt with here in the house, had actually gone through conviction. And that is why it rose to the conversation that was a felony, mind you, and it rose to that age. Across the uh, building, when we expelled David J, and many of us were staffers, and we were working with uh, organizations, that individual had three drunk drivers, had hanging charges of domestic violence, and a whole series of other things added to that. And what I really struggle with is that today we're going to have a vote on expulsion, and we haven't even started a criminal investigation. The past precedents of this chamber have been to allow the legal process to move itself through. And that's one of the reasons why yesterday I put forward my resolution to demand that the state police and the attorney general take a look at what criminal charges are actually in front of us today. You didn't even make a major resolution. Ask the senators to the uh, secretary of state, the attorney general, or the state police. You could have done it as the report was done. You could have done it as the committee was formed. You could have done it as the committee finished its work. But if you really believe these people should be expelled, why didn't we go through that criminal part of the investigation? So I get to the process. And in the end, the process does matter. That is the one thing we can control. I can't control the actions of the two members. I find them despicable, the actions that they took. I find it an embarrassment to the institution. But the question is, doing a rush process is also disrespect to this institution. It should be given the opportunity for us to learn all of the information. So let me start off with my concerns of what that process was. Uh, I've already said this uh, to uh, the legal counsel the majority. I didn't feel it was appropriate for staff to make any recommendations to the members. Uh, the Constitution allows us the right to expel members, not staff. We should have had a staff person, I mean, a, a member, whether it was the chair of the committee or the speaker of the House. I feel that that should have been the starting point of the conversation about whether we should expel a new session. I don't believe it's the role of staff to do that. Because again, that piece is really up to member to member. It is our constitutional duty. I also was concerned with the flow of information. I found out uh, recently that uh, one of the uh, individuals that we're talking about expelling, that she submitted a letter on Friday that my members didn't even get the opportunity to see until Tuesday. There was conversations happening over the weekend, obviously between her legal counsel and the uh, speaker's office, and my members still did not have access to that information. Tuesday night, we also found out an email that had been exchanged between the legal counsel of one of the representatives and the legal counsel of, uh, of the majority. We never had the opportunity to see that until the full report was actually presented to the media. My members and your members, if you were not on the committee, had the opportunity to receive this on Tuesday afternoon. Not because the House Business Office sent it to us. They didn't. We had to go to a media outlet to get that. If you are asking me to make the most important decision a legislature can make, the most extreme action a legislature can make, you didn't even have the due respect to send me the 800-page report. 
I had to go to a media site to get access to it. If people were sent to it, uh, I wasn't. I never received that. And then to expect all of us to read through the 800 pages of my hours video. I can't imagine unless you've been on the committee that you've had enough time since Tuesday to actually read every single page and listen to all five hours of the audio. And I have not had that opportunity. And that's why it makes it very difficult for me to actually move this process forward uh, at this point in time. Now, I heard uh, my good friend from the UP talk about um, there being some kind of deal. And now I've read in the media that there was some potential deal between uh, one of the members and the speaker's office taking a look at potential censure. And I want to know what was offered for that. Oftentimes in court proceedings, when you stipulate to a recommendation, you probably say, hey, stipulate to these facts, and we will then move this forward. So is that what occurred? I don't know that, because nobody during the testimony of individuals talked about that conversation in that deal. I didn't know that deal was true until I obviously heard that, you know, the chair of the committee has at least heard about this. I just thought it was something in the in the paper, but now it's obviously true that there was a conversation about it and there was, you know, obviously he was not involved in it. But I do not know that it did occur. And why were we not given the information that there was a conversation uh, between the speaker's office and the individual and that for the potential stipulation of those facts, that there was a recommendation for a uh, potential session. To me, I have to understand uh, all of those, uh, those issues. Also, there were people who were on the list of witnesses that we wanted to have come forward. Now, we've been told time and time again, well, everything is in the 800 teams. We have two whistleblowers who had the opportunity, obviously, to speak with the legal counsel as well as with our house business office director and put things into a record. They were not under oath. They did not have any members that I'm aware of that were part of that process. Again, we're expelling somebody and no member was sitting in that. And Mr. Speaker, if you were sitting there, I apologize, but my understanding is it was that there was not a single member in those conversations and those interviews. So how did we actually now get to a level of expulsion when not a single member has actually heard testimony from these two individuals. Now I keep hearing, well, it's in the report. But these individuals, if you had subpoenaed them, would have been under oath. And that, to me, is what's the most important piece. And that is one of the pieces that is missing here today. That the two whistleblowers who were not under oath did not have an opportunity to, uh, to testify. Again, we have talked a lot about the uh, timeliness of information. Uh, we talked a lot about the time that we have had to review this. And so my question is, why are we doing this today? This was not even on our agenda today, right? We did not know that we were coming here today to vote on this. Why couldn't we be given the weekend to go through 800 pages and five hours of audio? Don't we owe that to the state? Don't we owe it to the 90,000 people before we nullify the election? I think so. And that is why you have heard some of my members that are concerned. I not, will not be surprised that if at some point down the road, these members are expelled from this institution. Hey, they might be today as well. And if they are gone, that's fine. Politically, for me, having two people of that extreme nature probably benefits me in the issues that I'm fighting for. But that's not why we're here. We're here to follow a process and to understand where we're moving things forward. And I think the last thing that was probably the most disturbing to me was the testimony that we had yesterday. A uh, testimony of the former uh, chief of staff of the uh, speaker who came forward and then we struck out of the public record his comments. And, you know, I just went through, and let me, let me do this for you, because I know many of you have not had uh, the opportunity to read all 800 pages. But, you know, if you did, there's a few pages I want you to take a look at. You know, if you take a look at pages 150 to 
chief of staff and these two whistleblowers. So it is very clear in the record that has been presented to us that there was information that was available of an unfit environment for individuals to work there. Those two whistleblowers gave us information, but yet found themselves terminated a couple months later. They were whistleblowers, and we did not provide them protection. We have failed those two individuals, and you don't even want to hear their testimony. And that's why you're hearing the concern for many of us, because today our work is not done. I understand people want to get this over with. I want to get this over with. But until I have the two people that started this whole thing under oath, under oath, then I don't think we've actually done our due diligence. And then for the historical precedents, allow the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, and the State Police to do their work so we can understand the criminal charges. Again, we're going to take the most extreme action, which is to nullify the vote of the people. We do not have all of the information. We do not know all of the facts. And we have time to make sure we do this way, that we have these facts, that we have people under oath, and that we bring them in and subpoena. You put in your resolution, 129, which I supported, that you would subpoena people if possible. That did require us to actually vote today to uh, to subpoena them. But you haven't given us that opportunity. So our work is not done here today. It might be done in a week, two weeks, maybe three months. But we need to make sure that we do all of our due diligence. Because I would not make the most extreme action that the Constitution allows without having all of the facts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Representative Singh. The Chair recognizes Representative Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in opposition today to the House resolution that seek to expel State Representative Cindy Gamrat and Todd Corsi today. Being the Minority Vice Chair of the Select Committee to examine the qualifications of Representative Cindy Gamrat and Todd Corsi, I saw the available evidence presented to the members of the committee. During the last three days of the committee hearings, my colleague, Frank Liberati, and I has numerous questions for those to testify, only to be ruled out of order as it was not relevant to the task of the committee. Each one of our questions specifically had evidence stemming from the actual report. When I mean the actual report, I mean the big, thick, black line. It was in there. And we were unable to get our, our questions answered. I still have many questions that have not been answered. And when former Chief of Staff Norm Sari testified in the committee, and mind you, I asked Mr. Sari if he ever met him before, and he said in passing, but I, I had never had a conversation with him. But anyways, when he testified, the body did an unprecedented thing, completely striking his testimony, despite our questions pertaining directly from the report provided to us directly relevant to the firing of the staff. Based on the evidence provided, I felt there was enough evidence to significantly censure both Representatives Gamrat and Corson, but without hearing direct evidence from the two key witnesses and getting all the possible evidence and information, I was not ready to proceed with the resolution to expel both members at this time. You must remember to expel them, the threshold was much higher. But I want to say this, I've been a police officer for 28 years. I've been retired for 11. I did numerous trials. I did numerous union arbitrations. I did workers' comp hearings. I, I have an extensive background. And not once in any one of the hearings was I not led to cross-examine the main complainants in this uh, series. So when I sought to subpoena power in committee to bring additional witnesses forward to get the answers to the question, I was denied. The staffers that were being subpoenaed are central to the allegations specifically challenging the qualifications of Representative Corson and Gamrat to continue their legislative service. In addition, at the beginning of the hearing, House Republican Legal Council advocated for the expulsion of Representative Corson 
and a censor with strict conditions for representing Amram. Yet, with little explanation or discussion, we are moving today to expel both of them. Although the majority of my legislative colleagues did not have enough opportunity to read and review the information presented to the committee and to receive the necessary answers to make the determination on how to proceed. You got to remember also that I wanted the two witnesses to come in and testify on the oath. Whether or not they would have came in, if we would have subpoenaed them, they would have came in. They could have took the fifth, or they could have answered questions, or they could have answered questions and took the fifth on some questions. But once you get a person in that chair across from the tribunal, that person is going to answer the questions truthfully to the best of their ability. I believe legislators should make an informed decision on whether or not to pursue these expulsions in a proper time and all the facts must be provided. This is something that we should not take lightly, and I do not take lightly, in the light of this historical precedent that established. Rather, I think we are trying to rush things through and not exercise the necessary due diligence to restore the faith and trust of the institution that is in the Michigan House of Representatives. And when I say that, I am talking to everybody in this world. 800 pages is a lot of reading. It took me three days to read it. I don't know if you guys can read or not, but it's just very hard to do. And I want to make sure that everybody goes through the evidence to make an informed decision. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative. The chair recognizes Representative. Who suffers most? I think it's those who depend on staff, committee 
assignments for representation. I think damage has done us some pretty important values that I believe in. You know, I, I'm a guy that's a conservative. I believe in limited government, the cause of liberty. I believe the longer that those words and values are associated with the behavior that's been put before us, as evident as they've been admitted to in the media, the more damage is done to those principles, whether you share those with me or not. Frankly, one thing that I don't think in sense is too strong a word. Each one of us sitting on this floor is one of 110 people out of 10 million who are given the rare and privileged opportunity to take things in which we strongly believe are passionate and attempt to persuade other policymakers that they ought to become law. I think this is a sacred duty and obligation. It's certainly a privilege. It's one that those of us who are conservative can use to advance our principles, and those who have different principles can use to advance theirs. The two legislators who share my general value system, in my opinion, have squandered that rare opportunity to have impact for the things they believe. I believe as long as this issue goes on, the institution of the House of Representatives will be damaged further in the public eye. Somebody said, what we do not condemn, we condone. Whether that be true or not, certainly I think that is the public's impression. Is this a distraction to the people's work? I observe that our friends in the media are here in volume today. Not because we were honoring first responders and families of those who have given their lives in the defense of this country, but because of this issue. When I go to public events in my district, people want to talk about this and not all of the other weighty issues that make up the people's work. One thing my standing here today is not motivated by is by ideology or because they're too conservative, but because I want to see the damage stopped to their families, to their constituents, to values I share with them, and to this institution. I hope no member of the body, other than those who already announced their intention, Will by voting or refusing to vote, willingly or knowingly, perpetuate the ongoing damage that is being done? I can't help but think of the example as to the substance of the question before us of a pastor. If your pastor was caught and admitted to, was reported in the media as being guilty of the behavior to which the legislators and issue have admitted, would you offer Christian compassion and grace and encouragement and prayer and even forgiveness to them and their families? That's what my faith teaches us to do. And so I make the pledge today, not that I have the expectation it will be welcome, that I'll give encouragement and counsel and prayer and grace and yes, even forgiveness. But would that person remain your pastor? Would he remain in a position of public trust and leadership? I think we all know the answer to that. I've been asked if I'm concerned about setting a new precedent, a low threshold, an absence of criminal prosecution or conviction. And I can honestly tell you I have no concern whatsoever. I trust some future two-thirds majority of this body to judge some future set of circumstances. And I trust this body to make the same judgment as we're given wide latitude to do by the Constitution of the State of Michigan. And I would point out that an investigation by the Secretary of State or the Attorney General or the Ian County Prosecutor or any other law enforcement officer may yet occur. And in fact, 
the evidence is now public and available to any of those law enforcement officers should they choose to act. But that is a totally separate and distinct question from the resolution for us today. We are not a court of law. We are not prosecutors. We are charged and authorized by the Constitution of the State of Michigan to individually, on behalf of the 90,000 people we represent, reach in our own minds our own judgments and conclusions as to the continued fitness for office and to the potential damage being done to families, constituents, important values, and to this institution. I would assert to you that from everything I've seen, all the evidence I've seen, the public, Republican or Democrat, or anything else, is not in doubt. And honestly, I believe that the public will hold accountable anyone who acts at odds with what I believe the public's conclusion is regarding the actual substantive question before us. I'm a Christian. May I also make reference to the Bible? First Revelation 3.19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and change.
painful and bitter to be as this is to join me in voting in favor of both resolutions of expulsion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Lynn. Chair, recognize Representative Mr. Speaker. I will to control the members who are coming to you twice today. However, my duties as chair of the select committee and the integrity I've tried to bring to this job have been questioned and misrepresented. Perhaps I did not speak clearly enough. There was no deal. No deal. There was no deal with that member. I made no deal. The speaker's office made no deal. There was no deal.
talk about emails that were not shared. Those emails consist of two, which I have right here, and anyone that wishes to take a look at them, may take a look at them. But I want to give a backstory about them because I think that it is disingenuous to offer something like that without telling the true story. It goes to the very heart and integrity of this process. These two emails are two emails that the representative of the immediate district turned over to her attorney one day before he sent them to our council. That was on the 4th of September, which just happened to be the Friday before a holiday weekend. And on the next day, next business day, Tuesday, they were made part of the public record. The subject matter, these are not um, key revelations that go to the very heart of what this case hinges on. These are two emails. The number of the idiots that were sent to her team about the United Political Act.
It is with a heavy heart that I ask all of you to support these resolutions to expel two of our own. We took an oath to fulfill the duties and responsibilities of representatives.